our second child was born, Rabbi Elaine and I did something unusual. Typically, one names a child after a relative or someone with a personal connection. We named our son after a German rabbi we had never met, as he had died before we were born. His name was Rabbi Leo Beck. We gave our son the first name Leo and the middle name Beck. In the tradition of George Washington Carver and Martin Luther King, <laughs> our son is Leo Beck Glickman. This past year, our adult education committee asked Rabbi Elaine and me to share with the community our personal journeys, why we became rabbis, what sustains us in our work, and if we had any influences that shaped us into the rabbis that we've become. The session was intense. That day we revealed how we came to this calling from very different places, but one part of our path was the same. We were both deeply inspired by Rabbi Leo Beck. That day, we did not share why. Tonight, I will. Why do we admire him so much to name our son after him? Two reasons. Because of what he wrote, and because of what he did. First, his writings. At the beginning of the 20th century, Leo Beck was a young rabbi serving a modest congregation in a small German city. He was unknown to the world until the publication of his first book. In those days, anti-Semitism was rampant even among Christian scholars. One wrote a popular book called The Essence of Christianity. In it, he made disparaging assertions about Judaism, calling it inferior. Leo Beck was furious. So in 1905, he responded with a book of his own called The Essence of Judaism. Rabbi Beck wrote of the unique dignity of the Jewish people and his pride in Judaism. It was a sensation among the Jews of Germany, indeed, all of Europe. The world discovered a rabbi who was thoughtful and completely original, offering a new understanding of the role of Jews in the world. He found meaning in our status as a minority. He said, quote, it requires religious courage to belong to a minority. The blessing of being a minority, he said, is that, quote, a minority is compelled to think. It's true. We Jews boldly chart our own course. We do not just go along with what everyone else says. The majority is thinking this way and jumping on that bandwagon. Except the Jews are asking, what about this way? <laughs> Jews question everything. A minority is compelled to think, wrote Leo Beck. This summer, we saw how right he was. Did you see the movie Oppenheimer? In the development of the nuclear bomb, the scientists that discovered, excuse me, the scientists that conducted experiments and ran the labs were primarily not Jewish. But the theorists, the innovators, 
the ones that charted new directions in thought were primarily the Jews. Isidore Rabbi, Edward Teller, Lamowitz, Oppenheimer, Einstein. A minority is compelled to think. Innovative thought is one of our defining traits. Leo Beck was the first to see this and articulate it and give it meaning. In fact, he said, it's the very purpose of our existence. Why are there Jews in the world? What is our role? He wrote, the Jew is the great nonconformist, the great dissenter of history. That is the purpose of our existence, he wrote. To be a minority, to provide dissent, to encourage the world to think. Friends, that was just his first book. He wrote many more, too much to address tonight. So I will share just one more teaching from Leo Beck as it has been one that is most influential to me. The great question in theology is, Why do good people suffer? And why in particular have the Jewish people been singled out for so much misery? Why do we follow the law of God when our history suggests that God has spurned us? Everyone asks this question. In truth, I used to fixate on it. When I was in seminary, it was the only question that interested me. Now, I don't fret over it. I rarely think about it. Leo Beck's teachings changed me. Leo Beck taught that there is one word that is essential. One word that matters more than anything else. That word is nevertheless. All great Jewish theology can be summed up in one word, nevertheless. The teachings of the Torah and the prophets, the Midrash and the commentaries, can all be summed up with that one word. Even if I suffer, nevertheless, I carry on. Even though our people endure centuries of persecution, nevertheless, we keep hope. Even though it seems at times that God has broken the covenant, we stay loyal Nevertheless, Rabbi Beck taught the essence of Jewish theology is that nevertheless. I must confess, the first time I heard that, I was disappointed. I wanted a real answer. Why is there injustice? Why is there evil? Leo Beck did not answer that, so I was unsatisfied. Only later did I come to see his brilliance. What matters most is what we do. We have to stay true to the covenant. But a crisis of faith threatens that. If we lose faith in God or feel that There's just no point. We might stop following the commandments. 
So we look to theology to restore our faith and our sense of purpose. An example. The Midrash teaches that the reward for good deeds will come in the afterlife. So if we see a kind person suffer on earth, we can take comfort in knowing that they will find happiness in the world beyond. Is that a good teaching? Yes, if it inspires us to follow the commandments. Another example. The Talmud teaches that the reward for doing a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. We find inherent happiness from doing good. Is that a good teaching? Yes, if it inspires us to follow the commandments. There will always be a crisis of faith. There will always be moments when we feel that God has let us down. The important thing is that we keep true to the commandments, nevertheless. Friends, as you can see, Rabbi Leo Beck's insights have been deeply influential to me and to Rabbi Elaine. But that's still not why we named our son after him. It was not so much because of his teaching, but because of how he lived his life. It was a life of dignity, selflessness, and unwavering courage. In the 1910s and 1920s, Leo Beck's fame and stature rose to the peak of German Jewry. He was the leading lecturer at the seminary and a regular speaker at every major synagogue in Berlin. But evil rose up from within Germany. When Hitler came to power, he first instituted a boycott of Jewish businesses, prohibited Jews from practicing law or working in the government. For a century, the Jewish community of Germany was famously diverse and divided. But now, terrified, they banded together. In 1933, they formed a single community body, the Represented Council of German Jews, to represent the Jewish people, to dispense funds for welfare, and help Jews emigrate to safer places. They elected as their president, Rabbi Leo Beck. Within one year, 35,000 Jews had left Germany. Leo Beck himself was offered a position to teach at Oxford University. He chose to stay with his people in Germany. In 1935, the Nazis instituted the Nuremberg Laws. They revoked the citizenship of all Jews in Germany. Jews were forbidden from public beaches, public universities, and public hospitals. The Nazis launched a series of book burnings nationwide of any book they deemed to be subversive. Among the titles that they sought to burn, Leo Beck's The Essence of Judaism. No one spoke up against the Nazis, not the newspapers not the judges, not the university professors. Leo Beck could not remain silent. As Yom Kippur approached, he wrote a sermon to condemn the oppression and evil of the Nazi party. He distributed advanced copies to other rabbis in Berlin. 
one copy got in the hands of the Interior Ministry. On the day of Yom Kippur, the Gestapo came to his synagogue. As the service began, they lined the center aisle on both sides, standing at attention. When it was time for the sermon, Leo Beck did not back down. He consoled his people, speaking of their sorrow and their pain. And then he encouraged them to resist. He said on that day most famously, we bow to God, but we stand upright before man. With those words, the Gestapo marched up onto the bima, arrested the rabbi in front of the Holy Ark. His arrest made international news and he was released the next day. Rabbi Beck began to urge all Jews to leave at once, but there was nowhere to go. He lobbied consulates and diplomats to accept Jews. He sent his only daughter and her family to England. His friends abroad urged him to take a visa for himself and get out of there. No, he wrote, I will remain in Germany to watch out for those who have not yet gone. In 1938 came Kristallnacht. The Nazis encouraged local mo mobs to destroy Jewish businesses. 200 synagogues were burned down. Thousands of Jews were deported to camps. Thousands more were beaten in the streets. That night, Leo Beck went to the Jewish Children's Hospital that had been smashed and gutted. The parents of the patients had come for their children. But there were 16 orphans at the hospital with no one to come for them. Rabbi Beck took them home that night. They stayed in his apartment until he could find each one a place to stay. By 1939, two thirds of German Jews had fled Germany. The Central Conference of American Rabbis invited Rabbi Beck to come to America. They had a job for him in Cincinnati. He declined. He stayed in Germany to help arrange a transport of Jewish children to England. A rabbi in England urged Leo Beck to come with the children. He declined. He wrote back, I will stay until the last Jew is saved. In January of 1943, Rabbi Leo Beck was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to Theresienstadt. He understood what this meant. Theresienstadt was a concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. It was a place of torture and hunger, typhus and dysentery. Three of Leo Beck's sisters had died there already. At the camp, Rabbi Beck was assigned the task of garbage collection. He and another Jewish man were strapped to a trash cart that they pulled around the grounds. The other man was a philosopher and the other prisoners would later recall how the two of them would spend their days pulling their cart and discussing philosophy. In the evening, Rabbi Beck made pastoral visits to the sickened inmates. Late at night in the barracks, he taught in the dark secret classes on Judaism. When the war ended, Leo Beck was still alive. When word of his survival reached England and the United States, the Allies immediately sent an escort 
to retrieve him. Major Patrick Dolan was ordered from Prague to collect Rabbi Beck and take him to London. The American officer questioned why there was such a fuss over this one man. He was told that Rabbi Beck was the Pope of the German Jews. When Major Dolan came to the camp, though, Rabbi Beck would not leave with him. He told the officer, I will not go until every Jew here has a destination. He made Major Dolan wait for two months. Finally, Leo Beck consented to go. After two years in the camp, he was 50 pounds lighter, but he was alive. He said to Major Dolan, the triumph of the Jews is that out of the ashes, they eternally renew themselves. With his life, Rabbi Leo Beck fulfilled the teachings of his books. He wrote that it takes religious courage to be a Jew, to be a minority. He lived his life with that courage. He wrote that the Jew is the great nonconformist, the great dissenter in history. And that was the role he played so bravely, even when the Gestapo stood in his synagogue, he would not conform. And perhaps most importantly, he fulfilled his teaching about the eternal nevertheless. Leo Beck witnessed more brutality and suffering than most of us can imagine. He had every reason to rail against God. He had every reason to abandon the covenant but he kept living with honor nonetheless. He kept following the commandments nonetheless. In his books, Leo Beck taught Jews to be proud of their heritage. The way he lived his life, it makes me proud to be a Jew. Mm -hmm.